Welcome, everyone, to this Good Leadership Podcast. My name is Charles Good, your host and the president of the Institute for Management Studies. This podcast is designed to provide you with actionable insights and tools that you can use from discussing the research, stories, and background from recognized experts and practitioners to accelerate your impact in your current role. I'd like to welcome again to the program Dr. Andrew Chate, who is the founder and president of the Phoenix Life Academy. He's a fellow with the Brookings Institution, where he facilitates programs for high-level audiences, from the Department of Defense to the IRS to NASA. He also has served as the adjunct professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania and is the author of two of my favorite books, great books on the topic of resilience and stress, Me, Equilibrium, and The Resilience Factor. So welcome again to the program, Andrew. Hey, Charles. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. So last time we discussed the first five days of this great 14-day regimen to reduce the stress in your life by becoming more resilient. Today, I'd like to get through those remaining days and start with day six, because we ended up on day five. Day five was refueling the right way, being mindful of what you're eating. Day six is a big idea here, and that's navigating your iceberg beliefs. If you could unpack that for us, what they are and why are they so important? We call them icebergs because they are very large belief systems that we have developed over time, beginning from childhood. And only the tip of these big belief systems is in our conscious awareness, just like only the tip of an iceberg is above the water. We recognize these because they come in the form of shoulds and musts, things about how the world should be, how we should be in the world, and other people should be towards us. We find that they come in three basic flavors. Some people have their icebergs stacked up mostly in the achievement space, things like if it's not done perfectly, it's a failure. Some have it more in the social space. I should always be there for the people I love. And others have it more in the control space. The more control I get, the better my life will be, or I should be able to do it all. Now, where these icebergs become problematic is that they stretch us too thin because we're trying to accomplish all of these things that humans simply aren't able to accomplish. So it can lead to burnout. It can lead um, to all of the uh, to clinical depression, clinical anxiety, and all of the kinds of problems that we know come along with low resilience. And they can also really give us, lead us to give too much of ourselves if we have caregiver icebergs. So we, all, we really seriously need to find a way to identify when they're playing a role in our lives and to make sure we create a better belief than this naive iceberg that we have. Wonderful. Well, so they're really in three domains you, you mentioned. The achievement domain, the social domain, and then the control domain. Does each individual have their own kind of default setting of where these icebergs creep in? Most people are able to say, yeah, I have more in one of these three than the other. But it's not like the old shell game where there's just one P under the three shells. We all have them all. And that's where they become problematic. Because I might have a situation in which I believe if it's not done perfectly, it's a failure. And that drives me to stay at work long hours to get this achievement piece of my life perfect. I may also have the social iceberg of I should always be there for the people I love, which is pulling me to be home. And if you throw a control iceberg in there, like I should be able to do it all, then this is a recipe for disaster. Now, work-life imbalance is real. Work-life balance, I think, is a figment of our imaginations, to be honest. I've come to believe that work-life balance is kind of like Bigfoot. There have been reported sightings, but no real hard proof. But these icebergs, particularly if we have them smattered across these three domains, they can take a really bad situation like work-life imbalance and make it impossible for us because we simply cannot achieve any single one of these icebergs, let alone them all. That's so true. That's such good information. Now, how do we spot the iceberg? You just mentioned one of those strategies. Look for words that, you know, should or I have to or variations of those. Is there another strategy that we can use to really be able to spot them sooner? We're feeling a lot of tension between different parts of our lives. It's probably because We're getting pulled in different directions by icebergs that are not compatible one with the other. Another surefire way to to detect it is if we have a big emotional response in in a moment and we don't really know where it came from. I think most of us have had the experience of walking away from a situation and saying, 
wow, I took myself by surprise at how angry I got or anxious or frustrated or sad. And that's because these icebergs tend to fuel these moments in time. I might be driving down the freeway and someone cuts me off, one of my go-to anecdotes, right? And really what I should think at most is, well, I just wasted five seconds of my life or that person was being careless, which might cause me a little frustration, a little anger. But if I find that I'm getting angry at an eight, nine or 10 and sort of nearing road rage proportions, then I've hit up against an iceberg. And that iceberg is probably something like, I should be respected and supported by all people at all times. People should do the right thing. We live in a society and it's decaying because people should be doing things that they're not doing. These are the sorts of icebergs that can take this one little incident and make it into mammoth proportions. So these are the kinds of indications that we've hit up against an iceberg. Well, and what you stated too is so important is, is once you've identified that you've hit up against an iceberg, it's really drilling down to, to detect that belief because you just mentioned the belief that maybe my rights are being violated. But with icebergs, the majority of it's below the surface, below our unconscious or below our conscious thoughts. So we really don't know what's driving it. So you have a four-step kind of technique that you use to say, look at what has happened. What does it mean to me? What's the worst part of that for me? And assuming all of this is true, why is it so upsetting? So perhaps you could use those four questions and just going through a quick example to give people kind of a demonstration of that technique for them to be able to really drill down and identify that underlying belief. Yeah, absolutely. When my colleagues and I were first experimenting with this whole idea of icebergs and how do we help our patients and our clients uncover these icebergs, we started to realize that even in therapy situations, we were tending to use these reflexive questions to get at the meat of the issue. And one night early on in that journey, I had my own experience where I was working upstairs in my little home office and this is a thousand years ago when dinosaurs roamed the earth with my wife and I before we had kids. And it was trash night and I could hear the trash truck, but I had this all nighter project. I knew it was going to take me all night. My wife was downstairs in the kitchen and I was thinking, you know, we can each hear the trash truck. We know it's happening. We're supposed to take the trash out to the curb. Surely this time, even though it's my job, surely this time she'll do it. And I heard her walking down, downstairs, walking around, and I thought, She's fantastic. And then I heard her come up the stairs and she came into the, our home office and said, yo, take out the trash. And I said, okay. But in my head, I was not thinking, okay. And I got to anger on a really a seven, eight, nine, probably more of a nine in that moment. And even though I'm not the kind of person who yells, it's just not in my nature to do that. I could feel it everywhere in my body, in my mind. And it took me a good 30, 40 minutes to get back on task, right? As it turns out, no one took the trash out, by the way. But the next day, I was experimenting with those questions and saying to myself, you know, I was thinking, um, this is going to cost me five minutes. And uh, well, what's the worst part of that? Well, the worst part of that for me is she's interrupting my really important work for a really small task. And why is that so upsetting to me? Well, if she doesn't respect my work, then she doesn't respect me. And what's the worst part of that? Well, work is really important to me, and so she doesn't really respect anything about me or my rights, and I should be respected and supported by all people at all times. So that, that should statement emerged from the morass, and I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe I've been carrying that around since childhood for all of these years, but it suddenly explains so much. And of course, the reason she didn't take the trash out too was because I wasn't respecting her downtime. You know, she was an attorney in the biggest law firm in Philly, and the first opportunity for me to abrogate my responsibilities, I just do it and abdicate it to her. So for both of us, these icebergs were operating. So these, these, these are really powerful questions that we can use in that moment. We're experiencing tension between domains of our lives or that big emotional response. where We can get the iceberg belief out. And for most of us, we're like, wow, that's a crazy belief to go through life with. That's never going to work out for me. And the reason for that is because we developed it at a time when we were kids, we weren't sophisticated. We weren't intellectually sophisticated. There's no nuance in these beliefs. It's all or none, black or white, and they don't really work in an adult world. And that's why we need to create a better belief once we have them out on the table. Love that technique. It's very effective. So now we've 
We've identified that it's an iceberg. We've drilled down to identify the belief. And then you have three different approaches depending on if you want to melt the iceberg, steer around the iceberg, or really embrace the iceberg, but just shave off kind of the trouble spots. So maybe we can just go through those briefly. Just the first one, embrace the iceberg while shaving off the trouble spots. You have a great example in your book on, you know, maybe an iceberg around punctuality. But what happens, you know, which is good to have, you want to be on time to things, but it could maybe have a trouble spot if you're late for whatever reason because of unforeseen circumstances. And there's a lot of frustration boiling up inside you and and you're doing other things now, you're externalizing, you're blaming others, you're generalizing. So it's just keeping that iceberg belief that, yeah, yes, I want to be on time to things, but how would someone then go about kind of removing or shaving off those trouble spots? Yes, and that is a great example. I'd like to offer another one that I think has emerged over recent times as being even more critical than that, and that of beliefs like, I should always be there for the people I love, and I should be all things for all people. Now, I think most of us would, would agree that these are pretty big positive values. These two are big for me. I should always be there for the people I love. I should be all things to all people. And I want to keep them. I don't want to throw them away, but I also recognize they're causing me problems. In the beginning of the pandemic, at three in the morning, I'm sitting in Phoenix, Arizona, worrying about my parents half a world away in Australia, even though my siblings and I, with our parents, have done everything, even though the, you know their advanced years have health issues, we've done everything we can to protect them from COVID. We really have done everything we can. And yet I'm still ruminating about it because this iceberg belief is pushing me to continue to ruminate. In the meantime, I'm not taking care of things that I can control, like my kids' online education. I'm kind of watching them atrophy because I'm too tired to deal with it after that night of poor sleep. So in those moments, we want to say, hey, look, it would be nice. It would be nice to be all things to all people. It would be nice to always be there for the people I love, but that's not possible. It goes beyond physics because most of us have family that are scattered across the country, if not the world. We simply can't do it. There is no cape in our closet with an S on it. So I need to be able to cut myself some slack. I want to keep the best of that, but realize that there are pieces of that iceberg that are really getting in the way. Love that. How about for melting the iceberg? You want to get rid of it. So you've spotted it, you've drilled down to detect it. How do you melt it? I should be respected and supported by all people at all times as an example for me of an iceberg that warrants melting because it's not buying me a lot and it's costing me a heap. So instead, I want to create a better belief. And I want to say to myself things like mutual respect is a really important part of the human condition. And I will do my, I will fulfill my side of that equation knowing that I can't control the other side of the equation. And I think I also want to say, and I'm going to go to my go-to anecdote, if I'm driving down the freeway and I'm, I'm heading home to my wife and family and someone cuts me off and I end up at home with anger at a 10, that's not what I want for my life. So I'm going to be saying to myself, am I really going to take this anger home to my kids? Am I really going to pollute this loving environment with this nonsense from some you know shenanigans that happen on the freeway? I'm inflating the importance of this. Am I really going to allow this to pollute my day? And by saying these sorts of things over and over again, and I also have this image of that iceberg just melting, then I'm in a position to melt that iceberg and make it go away forever. Great advice. So the final one is steering around your iceberg. How might someone do that? You know, when I was a professor at Penn, uh, I was teaching Psych 1. It had 800 kids in this course. And we would have three multiple choice exams and, and I had three teaching assistants. So each of us took 200 kids and we would give them the opportunity in 15 minute slots to view their exam. And inevitably I would get some kid who would say, your exam wasn't fair and I deserve an A. Now that really activated two of my iceberg beliefs, which is, you know, I should be respected and supported by all people at all times. And people should play by the rules. You know, you knew what the rules were going in. It's a multiple choice exam. You got to be, live with it and move on. But I found that it was getting in the way of being a true educator. So what I had to do there was not melt the iceberg, not even really keep it. I just sidestepped it. So in that moment, I would say, Andrew, when that comes up, you can't be trusted. You need to have something like an audio tape in your head and you just push play. And for me, it was, 
you might be right. My exam may have been unfair. Maybe you deserved an A, but I'm not changing the exam and I'm not changing your grade. However, if you want to use this time for us to go through the exam together and find out what went wrong and try to fix it for the future, that's something I'm willing to do. And I found that, you know, nine times out of 10, students are willing to go that route. One time out of 10, they would continue to use the session to complain about the exam and I would listen politely and then move on with our days. And this enabled me to kind of steer around that iceberg without really needing to deal with it that much. Thank you for providing some context for those three great ways to deal with your iceberg. It's such an important concept that I think people really need to go back and listen to this part of the episode and really unpack so they can start dealing with those and not still having them under the surface, but impacting and influencing their life. So day seven is burnout. We're not going to go too much into it, but there's four great pieces of that. It's, it's ditch the drudge. So if you can delegate things you don't like to do, get rid of them, reframe the rest, what's required of you, add in the good stuff that really motivates you and nourishes you. And then do active accounting. Um, spend a few minutes making a list of everything that has challenged you throughout the day, however big and small. Is there anything you want to add to those four steps or anything that you want people to know around this important topic of burnout? I think that burnout has only been on the rise over the course of the pandemic and dramatically so. I think a lot of people were suggesting that the great resignation was because people were reevaluating their value system and deciding they didn't want to be in this job anymore. That was certainly true after the Great Recession when we sort of reevaluated our materialism and putting too many eggs in that money basket. But it's not true of this. The Great Resignation happened because people could no longer hang on by their fingertips. They were exhausted, they had no energy, no motivation, and they were burnt out. And this is documented by some of the research that we've done. We followed 7,000 plus people from October of 2019 till the current day. So we've been able to study a lot of why people are doing what they're doing. So we know that one of the biggest aspects of burnout is that drudge. We need to re-inject some positivity into the workplace. We need to celebrate our wins. We do have things that we need to do. All of us have things that we need to do that we don't enjoy doing. That's part of life. But if we can pepper that with um, reinforcers and things we enjoy doing, if we can place some meaning on the drudge, yeah, this is something that I have to get through in order to do some of the more meaningful parts of my job, then it becomes easier to work our way through. So I guess the only thing I would add is uh, this is even more important than it was when we wrote the book. I agree with you completely. Day eight, tune into your positive radars. This I'd like to unpack a little bit because we talked about the negative radars, the emotional radars that you have. Love to just go through the process by which you know you identify these positive radars and the positive emotions that you list in the book and in your research is happiness, pride, interest and engagement, esteem and respect, love and contentment. And why don't we just pick one, um, you know, and all of these you should want more in your life. And you really got to train your mind and your radar to, to be more attuned to those. But I love the process by which you kind of say, okay, if you want this emotion in your life, let's pick happiness. How do you do it. And it starts with noticing what happiness feels like, right? Exactly. And if I were to say to most people, uh, you know, what do you think is the opposite of happiness? They would say sadness. Now we know that sadness is an emotion that pops in us when we have thoughts about loss, losing a job, losing a relationship, losing our wallet, whatever it might be, it's around loss. But it can also be a loss of a sense of self-worth. I thought I was good at something and now it's telling me I'm not. And we know that people develop a style or a radar where they are scanning for loss, so they get into sadness a lot, sometimes when the loss isn't real or they're exaggerating a real loss. Now, the opposite of that is happiness, and happiness is when we are noticing things that are good. We're noticing gains. Our negatively wired brain doesn't treat these two equally so. For that reason, you know, we often say some, something like, yeah, he seemed to, he really fell into that sadness. We're going to talk about falling into happiness, right? And so we have to be very mindful about those gains. I think this is very linked. And if, if with your permission, I'd like to also talk about contentment and frustration because these are very linked as well. And they might make my point just a little better than happiness and sadness. If I said to most people, when was the last time you were overwhelmed with frustration? 
They might say a few minutes ago when you started talking, we get that question very easily, right? We get overwhelmed with frustration. But if I were to say to someone, when was the last time you were overwhelmed with contentment? The very question itself doesn't seem to make sense. We get overwhelmed with contentment. We experience it. It passes across our face and enters our hearts a little. We dabble in it. You know, I think about it as being sort of like we jump into the pool of frustration, but we stick our toe into the pool of contentment. And so I think we need to get more even-handed around these things. We need to recognize these positive emotions when they're on us and really truly relish them, enjoy them, embrace them. Don't let them just go by. We can really help ourselves here by understanding the radars. Thoughts about gain lead to happiness, whereas thoughts about loss lead to sadness. You mentioned pride, and that's a really important one as well. People do experience shame because they believe they're not meeting their own standards of how they should be in the world. We experience pride when we think we've met them or maybe even exceeded them, but we don't celebrate it as much or focus in on it as much. And the same, obviously, with contentment and frustration. Lack of resources, the kind of thought that can lead to frustration, whereas I have everything I need leads to contentment. So we need to be focusing in on all the stuff we do have, practicing those gratitude exercises to get into that balanced state. So let's move now to day nine. Day nine is fitness and those fitness steps. Everyone needs to be healthier, work out more. Um, you have three steps in that, um, in that section on day nine, and that's first, navigate your icebergs. We've, we've unpacked that pretty thoroughly around your fitness, because everyone has certain icebergs about their fitness, like, who am I? Um, you know, being fit is just not who I am. Or if I get in shape, then and my partner doesn't, it's going to drive a wedge between us. So identify those icebergs, challenge your thoughts, zap them through that technique that we described earlier, and then get moving. Uh, yeah, this is research that we were doing out of the University of Arizona, out of the College of Medicine. We were offering a free program to people in the greater Tucson area. And we found that there were uh, people who were really motivated, but they weren't benefiting from the program. And when we scratched the surface as to why, it was the kinds of icebergs that you just alluded to. You know, we don't do fitness in my family, or it's going to drive a wedge between my partner and I. These icebergs are of such a magnitude that no one is going to fully embrace a program if they have them in their heads. And others we saw were really perfectionistic icebergs. Like, unless I run a marathon every day, I don't consider that to be good exercise. And that's not attainable. So we really encourage people to get around these big icebergs by just doing one little thing every day. That's all that's required, just taking a quick walk, you know, stretching, making sure that we hydrate, just really simple things that we can do to just get that fitness level up a little because it really is important. And we look about, we look at what we've been through over the last three plus years and we look at what we're going to have to face in the future. Unless we have those energy resources, we're going to be in trouble. So it's a really essential part of the mind body issue. And, you know, we do have to recognize that resilient people have energy. It's one of the things they have. And it's pretty easy to restock that energy jar in fairly easy to do ways. Wonderful advice. Thank you. Now, day 10 you, is strength, that work-life balance, which you alluded to earlier, really doesn't exist. So what are some tips or advice that you can give people to get more balance between work and their personal life? Understand that there are these three flavors of icebergs. I mean, if you have icebergs only in the achievement space, so it's all about work and doing things perfectly at work, your pathway is clear. You spend all of your hours at work and you ignore your loved ones. And if your icebergs are only in the social space, I should always be there for the people I love. It's my job to make sure people are happy. Your pathway is clear. You do it the least amount of work you possibly can for the least number of hours, and you devote your time to your family. But there are very few of us who only have icebergs in one of these domains. So understand that tension that's produced by the icebergs. And we have you know, easy step-by-step -step ways to create more balanced, more nuanced, more sophisticated belief systems are going to work in both domains. Well, let's move on then to um, day 11, because I think that'll need some unpacking, because I love what you say about explanatory styles. I know it's not your model, but it's a great model to learn for everyone. I think it's a game changer, and it's three dimensions. And I'll give those three dimensions, then perhaps you can unpack those and give some insights around what's the optimal style or what are some of the styles to be 
cautious of. So first dimension is me, not me. I'm to blame versus someone else is at fault. Second dimension is always, not always. Always is the cause is permanent or fixed versus not always. The cause is temporary and it's going to pass. And then the third dimension is everything, not everything. Everything this affects all aspects of my life versus not everything. It affects only one aspect of my life. Yes. And from these three dimensions, four main styles shake out if we shake the, the explanatory style tree. And I can illustrate those, I think, by thinking of and talking about some of the work that we do with kids. So we, we may work with kids who say are failing math. And we'll ask each kid one by one in a confidential space, why do you think you're failing math? This is another reason why you may come across this idea of explanatory style as why style, because that why question is how we kind of hook the style. Explanatory style is our habitual learned way of explaining the events in our lives and particularly our adversities like failing math. And we'll always find some kids will say, I'm stupid. And using the dimensions that you just talked about, that's a me, always, everything. It's something inside of them. It's a me. It's an always because it's a pretty stable kind of attribute. And it's everything. It's not just affecting math. Stupid, if we take it at face value, affects everything. And then, of course, we always find some kids who have that not me, not always, not everything style. Like this teacher's exams are just too hard. It's not about them. It's about this teacher, but they're done with this teacher and it's only about this teacher. And we find some kids who'll say, I just didn't study hard enough for this test. It's a me. It's a not always. It's a not everything. Now, our research shows that that me, not always, not everything style is the most resilient one to have. The always everything people they get boxed in and bogged down on problem solving because by definition, the causes that they are identifying readily are the ones that cannot be controlled and cannot be solved always and everything. And the me always everything is better than the not me because you're placing the locus of control inside of yourself. Now, having said that, most of the work that we're doing is trying to help always everything people become a little more not always not everything find those not always, not everything causes that they can do something about. And this is a profound and powerful technique. I agree with you. I think it's one of the most important. Every so often, though, we need to help the me, not always, not everything people realize that sometimes there are always and everything and not me causes of their problems. Because what we find is always and everything people like me, and I'm a not me, always everything, we tend to give up prematurely because we're going to dead end on that problem solving. But me, not always, not everything people, they tend to stay too long in a problem that's actually outside of their control, should that be the situation. And they are spilling valuable resources out on something that they can't do anything about. And that can lead to burnout. So none of these styles is great. If you ask me which one to adopt, I would say the me, not always, not everything, which by the way, is exactly the opposite of my natural style. But I still believe that what is most important here is flexibility. Now, unfortunately, the vast majority of people on the planet are blissfully unaware of explanatory style. But if we can work these flexibility techniques with our own thinking in our teams at work so that we're coming up with all the causes of a problem and starting to problem solve them all, and even within our families, I think that for my wife and I, teaching our children flexibility around their explanatory styles has been the greatest gift we've been able to give. Wonderful advice. And I love how the approach is that you make it, put it into manageable chunks, choose one problem in your life that feels unsolvable, identify why you think that's happening, and then notice any always or everything causes, encircle those, then come back to them with as many not always, not everything causes so that you're putting it in the proper context. And then once you've identified some of those alternative causes and come up with some new solutions, strategies aligned when you're not always, not everything focused. Let's move to day 12. Day 12 is live your life goals. And that's, you talk about four different steps. First, defining the goals, choosing one thing that you want the most, take one small step toward that goal and then make sure you incorporate that positive momentum 
to keep you going and motivated throughout that process. Yeah, the only thing I would say in addition to this is that we all have short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals. And as we've talked about you and I, Charles, many times over the years, sometimes our short-term behaviors are satisfying the short-term goals, but they're actually at the expense of the medium or even long-term goals. And sometimes the short-term stuff is inevitable. You know, we often talk about the difference between important work and urgent work. And often in the short term, we're just taking care of the spot fires and the urgent work. We're not leaving enough time for the stuff that we should be working on, even if it's just five minutes a day, so that in five, 10, 15, 20 years, we will have achieved that long-term goal. So it's very important for us when we think about goals, not just get stuck in the immediate short-term focus, but also make sure that we're leaving some time for the long-term. Now, often we will sacrifice the long-term for the short-term for obvious reasons. The short-term is right here, but unfortunately that's not the pathway to happiness. So we need to make sure that we've got a good balance in our day-to-day behaviors between the short, medium, and long-term goals. Wonderful. Next day, day 13, energize your work. You list three levels for work connection. Level one, I'm here for the pay and benefits. Level two, I need the pay and the benefits, but I also like the work. It challenges me and I like my colleagues as well. And then level three, I need a paycheck. I like the work and my colleagues, but I feel that I'm contributing to something larger than myself. How do we move up on those levels? You know, we discovered those levels because of an instant in time. It was really interesting to me. I joined the Brookings Institution in 2006, and they immediately tasked me with a a riddle to solve. And that riddle was that any way you look at it, the kinds of things that lead people to be happy and satisfied in their jobs are plenty in the private sector, things like not having to deal with red tape or bureaucracy, getting a really good salary, all of these sorts of things they didn't exist in the public sector, in federal government. And yet, again and again and again, Brookings studies showed that federal government employees are happier and more satisfied in their jobs. I was asked to solve that riddle, and I couldn't until I met this gentleman in 2006. And he, Steve, began to tell me his story. He told me that he was born in Waukegan, Illinois, a very frosty part of northern Illinois, that he graduated high school, had scholarship offers to college, didn't feel ready, got a job working on local farms. And he said to me, you know how it is. You know, you think you're going to do something for a year. Three years goes by, I'm still out there. And he said, one day I was out there, it was minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And I realized I don't want to do this anymore. And in that moment, he decided he wanted to become a rocket scientist. And he's a deputy director at NASA. And I said to him, why NASA? You could have made a lot more money in the private sector. And he said, well, yeah, um, but I know that with NASA, that every day I wake up, I know that what I'm doing contributes to the welfare of my country and the security of my nation. Now, as someone who's really interested in resilience at work, this seemed like a really promising thread of inquiry. So it was then that we started to ask people, why do you stay in your jobs? And the three buckets that you just described fell out of that research. And we saw that with each step up in connection from just the pay and the benefits to like the work, the colleagues, to I think what I do matters, that there was not just an advantage on job satisfaction, there was an advantage on resilience. So we need to do a better job in our own heads, in our teams, in our organization generally of joining the dots for people, helping people to realize that how what they do day in and day out contributes to the project of the team. And how does the project of the team fit into the overall mission of the organization? And how does that organization do good things in the world? And it might be the products that they are building and distributing, or it might be the philanthropic work that that organization does. But we need to join those dots. And when we do that, people will move up through the levels. And we see that when we do that, they have greater resilience for the road ahead. Thank you for unpacking that for us. And the final day in this 14 day program to really help you deal with stress and build your resilience is connect to something more. And there's four levels you identify of life connection. First one, level one is personal goals. It's the arena of personal development. Level two is family. Level three is community. And level four is spirituality. And you mentioned a great quote in there, or when life gets tough, the tough get connected. So how do we move up in these levels? 
in 2009, I was approached by the TED people to give a talk. And I said, I want to talk about resilience and spirituality and, and connection to greater meaning. And they said, no, you don't. And I said, no, I really do. Because by then, the data were incontrovertible that the higher we can be connected to something larger than ourselves, the more resilient we are. And again, with each of those four steps that you out outlined, individual goals, I just want the big corner office into our family, which is hugely important. My wife and I have our two kids. And then beyond that to community, maybe it's some of the boards we serve on or the work we do in one of our kids' schools. And then finally, something bigger than that. Each step up affords a, a step up in life satisfaction and a step up in resilience. In 2009, I wasn't there to proselytize or to have a big tent revival meeting, and I'm not now either. But the data are there that we want to connect to something. Now, the litmus test doesn't have to be religion or faith, not even really spirituality. The litmus test seems to be that we connect to something that was on the planet before we arrived and will be here after we've gone. Now, that might be a value system. It might be the what the you know the Marine Corps stands for. Whatever it is, finding that slice of eternity and contributing to it makes us more resilient. So for me, it was definitely the capstone of our 14-day program. And I get why that, in terms of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you may not want to start there because there's so much other stuff that we need to do. But if you've got everything wrapped up in your life, starting to put your mind towards what's the highest level that I can connect to, the highest level of meaning that I can do that will contribute. And that might be contributing to future generations by being a mentor. It can be as simple as that, but simple and powerful because it makes a real difference in people's lives. Well, thank you. And I love this program that you've that we've unpacked now, the 14 essential skills that will put you back in control of your life. And the flow of these skills is scientifically designed to get the needle to move on your stress radar instantly, then cumulatively. So great ways, great skills. You don't need to put um, a whole lot of time each day. You recommend 15 to 30 minutes a day for 14 days, and you're going to see the results. You absolutely will. And that is being demonstrated. This isn't something that we just plucked out of the air. We've worked really hard over time to make sure that we had good research validation for any skill that we're putting out there. We know that it makes a difference in people's lives. And I think even more so since the last three plus years unfolded where this need, there are evergreen skills, but the need is even greater than it's been before. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being on the podcast today and unpacking this great program. Remind our listeners how they can get in contact with you. I would love them to reach out to me via IMS, fabulous organizations, and they can certainly do that. But if you want to get in touch with me directly, email me. I'd love to hear from you. A-J-Chate, S-H-A-T-T-E at gmail.com. Wonderful. Thanks again for joining me on the program, Dr. Chate. A real pleasure, Charles. Thank you. Anytime. If you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to share with others and post about it on social media. You can also go to our YouTube channel, which has video recordings of all the episodes of this podcast, along with bite-sized segments, full single servings that are designed to answer your most pressing leadership and management questions. Remember, until next time, it's not what you know that counts, but what you do consistently that makes a difference.